<laughs> I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Shin Cho. He was the Department of Meteorology, uh, but also he's a state climate pathologist. That means if you have any complaints about the climate, here is a complaint. <laughs> we don't deal with the complaints. We only department. Department. get a request for climate data. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Cho graduated from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in 1981, and his area of research is climate, as evident by his great work on that. He's been with the University of Hawaii for many years, and uh, <coughs> his specific interest in climate change and the climate variability. Thank you, Ali, for inviting me to give a talk at the uh, Water Resources Research Center Seminar. And uh, uh, I'm with the uh, Meteorology Department, uh, also uh, you know, within the School of Ocean and Science Technology. And also, I'm a faculty member with the WRRC. And uh, my talk is on, um, uh, can we turn off the light? Yeah. <coughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, yes. much better. Okay. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the the talk is on uh, precipitation variability and trend in Hawaii. And uh, the talk consists of five parts. So I will start by showing relationship. Uh, precipitation, uh, this kind of climate change indices to study trend in precipitation. So this is a different from the second part. This is based on the total precipitation. So later on you will see the difference between part two and part three. And uh, part four is about the precipitation extreme, particularly the spatial patterns. In Hawaii, you know, we have a uh, we have a you know, heavy rainfall event and also associated flood. And some of those events have caused huge economic loss. So we need to better understand the, the, the patterns of the heavy rainfall event in Hawaii. And then the last part is about the future projections in precipitation and based on the statistical and the dynamical downscaling. So uh, we did some work on statistical downscaling, but for the dynamic downscaling, this is a current research. So you know some work is in progress, and I cannot you know do all of those work by myself. So you know I need to uh, acknowledge the contribution from Yan Chen, Wendy Chen, Chase Norton, Xin Dao, Tom Schrader. Some of you know Tom. You know, has been here for a long, long time. Retired just uh, about one year ago, and uh, Andrew Marcus and uh, Chris O'Connor, they are my current graduate students. So, and uh, Chris was sitting, Chris is sitting over there. All right. First is that about the uh, precipitation, El Nino, La Nina, and the Pacific PDO, to represent statewide rainfall variability, we choose uh, something called the HRI, that's Hawaii Rainfall Index. And this rainfall index is derived from monthly rainfall total from nine stations on each of three islands, Big Island, Oahu, and Kauai. And uh, for each island, three stations are located on the windward side, three stations located on the leeward side, and three stations located between windward and leeward. And on each side of the island, stations are chosen from low to high elevation. So these 27 stations represent the rainfall from varying elevation from low to high and also from varying uh, location with respect to the prevailing <coughs> northeast trend. And uh, the original rainfall data are standardized so that uh, the average of these 27 stations becomes the Hawaii rainfall <coughs> index. And uh, this is the uh, dimension is quantity. Okay, so this is uh, the, about the rainfall. Then the next is about the El Nino and the Marina. And this shows the sea surface temperature anomalies 
during El Nino, during La Nina. So what we see here is during El Nino, we, we observe a band of uh, warming along the equatorial central eastern Pacific. And sometimes the warming can be as large as almost uh, like a three to four degrees C. Hawaii is here. And the opposite is for La Nina, you have a band of cooling in the equatorial central and the eastern Pacific. And uh, the PDO Pacific Decade Oscillation uh, is characterized by two phases, positive phase, negative phase, or, or warm phase, cold phase. Okay. And for the positive PDO, that uh, you also see some sign of warming in the equatorial uh, Central Pacific, Eastern Pacific, but uh, the warming is much smaller. It's only about maybe 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 degrees C. And uh, the most significant signal occurs in the middle latitude of the ocean, not specific. And uh, so this is uh, the positive PDO. For the negative PDO, you have a cooling. Uh, you have warming here. You have a cooling there. Okay. So this is uh, somewhat similar to the El Nino, but uh, uh, the strongest signal is in the middle latitude. And uh, in the, for the El Nino case, the signal is the strongest in the equatorial region. And also, the PDO persists much longer than the El Nino. Usually, you know, more than 20 years or so. El Nino is basically the lifetime is about one year. OK, so uh, this figure shows the, uh, the rainfall. We use HRI composite during El Nino and the La Nina phase. And, uh, what we see here is that we do see low rainfall persist <coughs> from uh, November through uh, April of the following year, with the largest anomaly occurred in January and February. And then, you know, this is our winter rainy season. So this means that when the El Nino occurred, we expect to see low rainfall for almost six months consecutively. And uh, the reason for choosing this, this kind of time scale from July to June is that El Nino usually occurs in summer and the ridge is, is a peak phase in winter and then decays by the following spring. So we have this kind of cycle. And for the La Nina event, uh, we see rainfall was above normal. Okay, right? Also for these six months from November through, uh, through April. Okay? Just the opposite of El Nino. And the months with underlying indicates the difference in rainfall between these two uh, events is statistically significant. So it is significant October, November, January, and February. And then the middle panel is the rainfall composite during the positive and the negative PDO phase. And the vertical scale in the middle panel is different from the top one. So for the PDO, positive PDO phase, we, we do see a low rainfall uh, persisting from October through, through following May. But the magnitude is only about a half of that during the El Nino cycle. Okay. Here is minus 0.4, here is only minus 0.2. So it's much smaller, it's a, no, reduced by half. And uh, during the negative PDO phase, we also see more rainfall. And uh, if you composite El Nino events during the positive PDO phase, uh, which is shown here, is this pattern is very similar to the rainfall during the El Nino. Uh, you have a low rainfall from November through April, with the largest anomaly again in January and February. But uh, the magnitude is, is amplified compared to the top one here is minus 0.4. This becomes minus 0.8, double. And uh, for uh, La Nina occurred during the negative PDO phase, then you also see the opposite conditions, more rainfall during this time period. And uh, from November through the following February, you do see that uh, the difference reaches statistical significance during these four months. Okay, the previous one, we just used one index to represent the, the entire you know, state. Then people always question, you know, how about some locations? Would that be 
you know, different from the, the HRI uh, variations. So this shows the, the uh, winter rainfall difference in, in, in terms of inches. When the El Nino positive PDO extreme minus La Nina minus PDO phase. And here we have uh, 272 stations. So this is uh, uh, the legend for the, for the color in terms of inches. So we see that except for East Mokai and uh, one spot in upcountry Maui, all you know, all stations shows uh, deficient rainfall when El Nino positive PDO is compared to the La Nina uh, minus PDO. No, no exception. And here, there's only one station for Molokai, so this part is not a representative. And same, similarly, maybe for Maui, I think that uh, there's only one station here. And we do see the, the large difference, oops, large difference occurs <coughs> on Oahu and the Kauai. In other words, you have a more, uh, less rainfall during this phase. East Maui and also the, on the west side of the Big Island. And this one just shows the, the, the statistical uh, result, whether this difference is significant or not significant. It shows that all stations on Oahu and Kauai are significant at 10% level. Okay, after seeing this, then, you know, we wonder what is the reason for low rainfall during El Nino and the positive PDO phase. And this is the composite uh, of the SSC temperature in shading okay, and also surface wind in vector. So what we see here is that uh, when you compare these two climate extremes, you do see there's a deepening of erosion glow here. So this is shown by the, you know, this anomalous cyclonic circulations. And also, there is a you know, band of uh, uh, westerly anomalies, surface anomalies, okay. And also, you know, we have a band of cooling in the North Pacific, because you know here you have a westerly anomalies, so this would enhance the, the uh, evaporation and also ocean mixing, okay, leading leading to the cooling in this area. And uh, if you look at the equatorial region, you find that uh, there is a uh, warming you know, by about. Uh, over 1.5 1 degrees C. Okay. Of course, this is because you know you, you, you sample data from El Nino, so you expect to see you know warming in this area. And close to home in Hawaii, uh, for the wind, you do see you have a, you know westerly wind anomalies. Okay. So this would weaken the climatological easterly trade wind over the subtropical North Pacific because usually you have easterly or uh, northeasterly trade wind. So the reduction of the easterly trade wind implies a weakening you know, of the trade wind rainfall, okay, contributing to low rainfall in this case. And you can also look at the difference in the upper troposphere, very high. Uh, this is a, at the level where the, you know, the jet line cruises. And here, the, the, the shading indicates the, the area where the wind speed is greater than 40 meter per second. We call it jet core. Okay. And during the El Nino, when the PDO was positive, then you see the jet core extend far you know, eastward to about 150 west. And Hawaii is just located uh, you know, in the uh, right side of, of the leading edge of the jet stream. So in other words, it is located in the area of upper level convergence and subsidence and then low level divergence, which is not favorable for rainfall production. And uh, for the La Nina and the minus PDO phase, the, the jet retreats you know, westward to just the, to the east, just the east of the big line. Okay. And then the difference is about almost a 30 degree longitude. In other words, you know, the dis distance is about uh, more than 3,000 kilometers. It's a very large difference. And then uh, this shows the, 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 the wind patterns, uh, vertical circulation. In other words, this is the, the vertical cross-section of uh, longitude, okay? 
and their height. So uh, this is a near sea level. And uh, uh, the Hawaiian Islands are bordered by two vertical lines. So, so we are located here, near 160 west. And this is averaged uh, over the subtropical latitude, 15 degrees to 25 degrees north. So what we see here is that, again, this is the difference between these two climate extremes. So what we see here is there's a very pronounced east-west zonal circulation with a rising motion over East Asia and a sinking motion over Hawaii. And this sinking motion is very deep, extending all the way from surface to the upper troposphere. Sinking motion. So this would suppress rainfall in, in this area. Yeah. What, what data did you use to construct? Oh, 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 this data comes from the NSEP. NSEP real how, how far back do you go? Oh, how, uh, we, we looked uh, during the, uh, I think this is uh, far back to 2003. Oh, 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 two, 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 oh, Okay, so uh, the second part is about this long-term rainfall trend. So here we use the, uh, the annual value of the uh, Hawaii rainfall index uh, from 1905 up to June this year because we define the uh, index from July to the following June for the annual value. So what we see here is that uh, during the first uh, first uh, of more years, the trend is basically flat. The trend is indicated by this uh, solid line. But uh, since 1980s, we do see there's a, a downward trend, very, very, you know, very obvious. Okay. It's a downward trend during the last 30 years, 30 years or so. So this is a kind of different from the you know, what happened in the past. Okay, then uh, let me, let me uh, shift to the uh, trend in climate change indices. So previously I mentioned about uh, this uh, climate change indices defined by the WMO, World Meteorological Organizations. And then we adopt some of the uh, indices from WMO. The first one is we call the SDII, Simple Daily Intensity Index. So this is uh, uh, this measures the average precipitation intensity in wet days. So in other words, when there's no precipitation, that values, you know, uh, that days do not, you know, uh, come. So that uh, uh, this, the unit is millimeter per day. So this is a measure of rainfall intensity, how intense rainfall is. The second uh, index is R25. That's the annual total number of days with daily precipitation greater than one inch. So this is the days, like uh, this year you may have uh, 30 days of uh, daily rainfall greater than one inch. And the previous year you may have uh, 25 days. So each year you have some numbers, then you can, then you can tabulate uh, the, the number of days with daily rainfall greater than a certain amount. Okay. And this can be used to measure you know, approximately the frequency <coughs> of daily rainfall event. And the third one is the annual maximum consecutive five-day precipitation total. So you need to, to compute the uh, five-day precipitation total. Then to see, uh, then, then you pick the, the maximum value for that particular year. So the unit here is millimeter, and you skip the, the, four, the fourth one. Oh, I don't know why they some problem. The fifth one is the CDD called the uh, consecutive dry days. That is the annual maximum number of consecutive dry days. So this is the uh, unit is days. So this, this three measures the precipitation, uh, and the last one measures the duration of dryness. And the method we use to, to detect trend is we call it the, the main candle method, and also combined with sense test. Okay. And uh, usually, when we people study trend, they use a linear regression method, but this method is subject to certain assumptions, which may be uh, not valid for extreme precipitation data. So that's why we choose to use the MKS approach, so that uh, the advantage is that uh, underlying data do not need to follow certain theoretical 
distribution and also missing data uh, a lot. This is very important because in Hawaii we do have a, a lot of missing data. And also this approach is robust against the outliers and the skewed distributions. So it's a robust trend detection method. Okay, so this one shows the, uh, the spatial patterns of trend okay, from 1950 to 2007. And the, the triangle here, uh, when you see a downward triangle, means the trend is downward. When the triangle is going upward, it means the upward trend. And then when the triangle is a solid, means that the trend is statistically significant. So what we see here is that uh, for Kauai, uh, most stations show a downward trend, but none of them you know, is statistically significant. And for Oahu, we do see some, uh, well, you know, this downward trend is still uh, pretty prevailing, and some stations show this trend is really significant. Uh, for Maui, that uh, the pattern is kind of mixed because some station shows upward trend, some station shows downward trend. Okay. And uh, for the big island, that uh, most stations shows the upward trend. So this is uh, different from Oahu and uh, Kauai. So we do see some regional difference. Usually people think that you know, in Hawaii everything is the same. If you have changed, then everything is going to the same direction. But we do see some di uh, regional difference. And in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of this R25, that is the, uh, the annual uh, number of days with daily rainfall greater than one inch, and we see that uh, downward trend prevails on Kauai and Oahu, pretty much like this one, okay, like SDI, Single Daily Intensity <coughs> Index, and for Maui and uh, Hawaii, the, the change is not so obvious. So, you know, summary is that we do see downward trend in simple daily intensity index and R25 uh, for Kauai and Oahu. And for the big island, we do see upward trend in SDI. So this means the rainfall became more intense for the big island since 1950s. And uh, in terms of R5B, that is uh, five, uh, five, uh, five consecutive days rainfall. We do see that uh, we have downward trend for Kauai, we have downward trend for Oahu. It's the pattern is very similar to SDI, okay. to the intensity index. And for the big island, again, you see that uh, some station shows upward trend for five day consecutive rainfall. And uh, comes to the uh, drought index, consecutive dry days that uh, almost all the stations, you know, all, almost all islands shows you have some upward trend in consecutive dry days. So in other words, for CDB, that uh, positive trend prevails. Positive, you know, means that you have more consecutive dry days. So in other words, most islands show longer consecutive period of no precipitation days since 1950s. And uh, the change is most significant on the Kona side of the Big Island and also East Maui. <coughs> so that uh, a summary for this part is that the uh, trend of four country change indices uh, exam over the last 60 years, results show some regional patterns. Okay. Oahu and the Kauai looks on, they are on one side. Okay. And uh, uh, Big Island <coughs> is, is the, the opposite. Okay shows increasing trend for both SDI and R5D. And in terms of this uh, CDD, all, almost all stations shows upward trend. And uh, Kona and East Maui experience significant dry conditions and the more distinct dry, uh, dry wet conditions over Big Island. So in other words, when it rains, rainfall becomes more intense for Big Island. And when it does not rain, then the dry period becomes longer. So there's a more distinct dry wet patterns. And this probably is not good for agricultural and also for the ranching industries. Okay, then uh, let's shift the gear to the fourth part is the spatial patterns of extreme events. 
And uh, when I studied this, I, I looked at uh, you know, a paper uh, published in Bulletin of American Meteorological Society 201 uh, by many authors from, from NOAA. Okay. So they, they use a three different way to define heavy rainfall. Okay. For example, the, the first the method they use is based on the annual number, I mean annual number of days on which uh, daily rainfall exceeds certain amount, like uh, you know, two inches, they, they call heavy rainfall. Okay. And if daily rainfall is more than four inches, it's called very heavy rainfall. You know, this, this definition is uh, simple, straightforward, but, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work very well because, uh, you know, in, in, in the area where you have a rain, lots of rainfall, no problem, but, uh, you know, if you, have, uh, if you are you know, in the dry area like uh, Nevada or some, some places, okay, it's very difficult to, to get, uh, you know, two inches of you know, rain in a day, so let alone be four inches. So that uh, this kind of uh, you know, definition is really you know, skewed toward the area where you have a lot of rain. And the second approach is based on the uh, precipitation distributions. So here, uh, the value associated with uh, specific uh, rainfall percentile, in other words, 90th percentile, you call it heavy rainfall. 99th percentile, you call it very heavy rainfall. So this is based on each, you know, single st uh, stations. So basically, you are looking at the, the <coughs> tail end of the distribution. And this is probably more uh, sensible way for defining the heavy rainfall and the very heavy rainfall. Yeah. And the third approach uh, they used is to use the annual maximum daily rainfall as, uh, associated with the return period, like a two year for a heavy rainfall, and 20 year for very heavy. So this is based on some kind of return period. And uh, let me explain what is the return period. Return period, also known as a recurrence interval, so it is the average time between occurrence of an event of that magnitude or greater. So commonly used for engineering design and risk analysis. And uh, suppose we, we talk about a 100 year flood, so this means that there's one chance, one percent chance of being exceeded in any one year. So that's the most uh, straightforward uh, definition for the <coughs> return period. And here, we estimate return period of uh, uh, heavy rainfall event using the annual maximum daily rainfall and also a generalized extreme value distribution called GEV. And uh, uh, GEV, the, the cumulative distribution function is shown here. So it has uh, three parameters. Location, scale, and the shape. Location, scale, and the shape. And uh, we also needed to estimate this uh, uh, what is called a return level, so corresponding to the return period, so one over p. So the p is probability of occurrence. So this is return level is shown by this equation. And uh, talking about a heavy rainbow event, we know this is a pretty common in Hawaii, and uh, due to the interactions between you know, synoptic weather system and the local you know, terrain. So we have heavy rainfall events, cause damage to property, agricultural, transportation, public facilities, like a Halloween, you know, 204 event here, just right here. Okay. And uh, this is also you know, picture taken on that day. And uh, we have a flood event on Kahalamo 206, Kauai and the December 2008 flood of Oahu, Kauai and the December 2010 flood event. So almost every other year we have some kind of event. And uh, this shows the, uh, the Kaloko Dam failure on Kauai in March 2006. So that killed seven people and also caused uh, uh, very you know, lengthy litigations. And uh, this shows the, the, the flood okay, in Manoa at the uh, Hamilton Library, is a whole mess. Okay. So the pollution carried you know, away by stream flow during heavy rainbow event also you know, one of the major threats to marine ecosystem, particularly co uh, coastal reefs. Okay. So you know, it also has impact. Okay. And uh, this 
this one just uh, shows the, uh, the spatial distributions of heavy rainwater event based on the first definition. So in this one is just uh, based on the daily rainfall greater than two inches. And uh, the, the unit here is days. <coughs> so this shows that, uh, for example, the most noteworthy feature is, uh, is a relative maxima at the lower elevation on the eastern slope of the island. <coughs> Almost all the you know, major islands, you do see some kind of relative maxima of heavy rainfall days. And uh, the most uh, significant one occurs on the, uh, on the big island something like uh, 20 to 25 days per year. Okay. And also one spot on Maui, and uh, nothing here, but, and also one spot on Kauai. Okay. Because what happened is that, uh, you know, we, no, usually we have this uh, northeast trade, right? you know, as they are uh, back to the, to the island because of the mountain, so, you know, they are forced to rise, okay. and uh, this results in cooling clouds and uh, rain. So we call it orographic, orographic uplifting, which is most uh, pronounced because you have the high mountain Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa here. But also in Hawaii we have a, we have a you know, land sea breeze and also mountain and the valley breeze. Very, very pronounced on the big island. So this kind of uh, you know, thermally driven downhill circulations they also contribute to rainbow development by you know, enhancing the, the trade wind and also enhancing the, reducing the low level convergence. And on the west side of the big island, we do see that the number is fairly low, only zero to five days of heavy rainfall because they are located in the lee of Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea. <coughs> so that they experience very low number of heavy rainfall days. So in other words, we do see there's a very significant gradient from east to west in terms of a heavy rainfall day. And also similarly on Maui, you have this kind of east to west contrast. Oahu, you have a, you know, some maxima on the, on the Kula range, but it's only five to 10 days, not too bad. For Kauai, the north facing slope is exposed to trade wind. So it's subject to very heavy rainfall, particularly at the wildlife climate in the summit. That is pretty high. And uh, this one shows the uh, heavy uh, rainfall. Days. Actually, this is a very heavy rainfall day. Okay. Based on the 20 year return period. So this is based on the third approach okay. that uh, we use the GEV, GEV models. So this shows just for Oahu that, uh, except for a few spots on the leeward coast, uh, daily maximum rainfall is more than 200 millimeters associated with 20 year return period. And we also see there's a band of maxima extending from Kula Ranch uh, to East Oahu to Wamanalo. This area is more than 275 millimeters. Because this is a 20 year return period, so the probability of, of observing, you know, this kind of rainfall in any single year is it's five percent, not too low, five percent. So you you could have a more than two hundred millimeter less than about eight inches rain rainfall in any particular year. Okay, summary for part four is that. Uh, we have a, a heavy rainfall event in Hawaii that are pretty common and also occur at the lower elevation of the windward slope of the mountains. Local maxima of 20 to 25 days a year are observed on Big Island, East Mountain, and Kauai. And for 20 year return period, that's a very heavy rainfall event. Daily maximum rainfall is more than eight inches for almost entire Hawaii. And the result, you know, can be used for engineering design, particularly for urban drainage, because they want to know, how, you know, how heavy the rainfall could be. Right? And also for flood insurance rate maps, and also for environmental regulations. Okay, now uh, let's shift the gear to the the last part of my talk: projection of future climate change. Because we know climate is changing, so there's a large uncertainty about the future fresh water supply. And we need to come up with a, a 
a reasonable method to estimate future change. And uh, prediction of future change uh, based on general circulation model called the GCM, or uh, more recently called the Earth System model, ESM, and the latest is the coupled model into comparison uh, file. And when you use uh, this kind of models, and uh, you, you have a problem for Hawaii because their resolution is pretty coarse, 100 to 200 kilometers. And uh, you know that islands in Hawaii are very small, 50 kilometers, except for the big island. Okay. It's a complex terrain. You have mountains, you have valleys, and okay. so on, and different landscape. So in other words, for example, microclimate in Oahu cannot be represented by coupled models, in other words, by these kind of models and necessary to downscale the model output through statistical or dynamical approach. So to obtain local knowledge of future climate change. So this will provide water agencies or you know, researchers with the information such as rainfall, evaporation, wind speed, or whatever, or solar radiation needed to plan and then prepare for this future change. Okay, uh, let me just say something about the statistical downscaling. First, uh, the idea is to find an empirical relationship between large scale atmospheric conditions, like uh, we call it predictors, such as the wind, humidity, sea level pressure, and so on, and the small scale variables, we call it predict time. In this case, it's the rainfall, because this is what we are concerned about, okay. using some kind of statistical method. So, this is uh, the, uh, the essence of the statistical downscaling. And for Oahu, you know, I pick up Oahu as a case study that uh, we use the historical rainfall data over the last 30 years. Also, the NSAP reanalysis data okay, for the uh, current climate condition and also the GCM simulations to project future changes in precipitation extreme. So we define precipitation extreme as those exceed the 90th percentile of daily rainfall distribution. So in other words, it's a heavy rainfall. And uh, when you come to reality, 